Okay, I um, presentation. I would just like to say for the record that we did not um, we did not find the shipwreck, but we identified the shipwreck. So I'm going to take you on a journey and a little history story, and um, just ask you to join along. Now we're really blessed to have Thelma Dahl on this tell on this um, webcast with us. She's the great granddaughter of the captain of the Octavian. So when we get to the end of the presentation, I'll unmute Thelma and she can say a few words about a project that she did regarding the Octavian, which was sort of like semi-simultaneous of us finding the Octavian. So um, it's kind of neat. And um, hopefully um, it's midnight in Norway, but Thelma's young, she'll probably stay up and not fall asleep. Okay, ready? Let's do it. The Octavian Project. Uh, we made this project in memory um, of our friend Bart Malone. And um, for those that you, of you that know me and have heard the story up close and personal, I personally believe Bart had a lot to do with, this, with what happened here. So this presentation is made for divers and non-divers alike. So let me just, um, so just keep that in mind. If you're a diver, you might know some of these things, but I'm just going to go through it for divers and non-divers alike. So who are we? We're just regular working family people who love the sea and love shipwrecks. We're telephone workers, sheet metal workers, truck builders, salesmen, auto mechanics, writers, electricians, home builders, contractors. But this is a privately funded um, endeavor just to fuel our passion. The identification team um, happened on July 4th, 2018, and it's myself, uh, my partner, Brian Sullivan, Michael Dudas, and Tom Packer. Uh, team two included Tim Terry, my dive buddy of over 30 years, uh, Steve, the Greek LaGreca, and John Copeland. So exploring shipwrecks in the sea is our passion, and we have thousands of shipwrecks off the East Coast of the United States. So pictured here, you can see um, a submarine on the right, the S5, the Admiral DuPont paddle wheeler. We have the Monroe, which was a passenger liner sank in the early 1900s. We have the Edward Cole, which was a Black Sunday wreck sunk by a U-boat in World War I. So that's what we're out to look for, shipwrecks. But exploring shipwrecks takes a lot of equipment and a lot of gear. So um, you can see all the different tanks and compressors and gas that it takes. So it's not like just grabbing your golf bag. It's really, um, it, it's, a, it's a commitment to say the least. But like my friend Steve Gatto always says, that it's really about a day on the water with your friends and the diving's just a bonus. And you can see in these, some of these pictures, um, they're very special. The picture on the left, this is Captain Bill Tattersall but this is my daughter, Sarah. So the fact that we're diving together, that Bill's diving with me and my daughter, it's kind of like Mike and I always talk about, it's the classics, for real. So um, it's really super special. You have Steve and Tom here. You have Timmy with all, we took all the kids. I mean, this picture of Bart floating in the sea, um, it's just so special. And the Greek and John Copeland, it's just really a good time with your friends. But also we get to feast on the bounty of the sea. Um, the big dog here, he got himself a little lobster, 16-pound lobster. Uh, we have a few scallops and lobsters here. Timmy, the slayer, um, always getting something and a little light barbecue on a boat for lunch. And preserving maritime history. So this young fellow here, he's on, this, he's on the presentation. This is Mike Boring. And this is Gary Gentile. And the reason I included this picture and Tom Packer, obviously, because Tom was on our discovery trip or on our identification trip, and Gary helped with the identification. And this is the bell from the Andrea Doria. So it's interesting how over a matter of almost 40 years or something like that, that all these people get tied back together um, because of their passion of diving. And then again, you have Andrew Nagel and Mike Dudas, whose parents were both diving legends, again, tied together by finding a ship's bell. and Sarah and myself finding the porthole and just a lot of good times with a lot of really, really great people. 
And the other thing we get to see is spectacular marine creature interaction. One of the things about diving is you just don't know what you're going to see when you go out on that boat that day. You might see an ocean sunfish, or you might have a breaching whale eating a school of fish, or Timmy could be swimming around on the surface interval and uh, following a little whale around, or a turtle just swims up to you to say hi. So let me tell you a little bit about our diving platform. Um, our boat is called the Research Vessel Explorer, and we're based out of Cape May, New Jersey, which is on the way east coast of New Jersey, the very tippy bottom of, of New Jersey. And um, we're a 42 foot long boat. We have a 20 knot cruising speed. Uh, we have a diver lift, or as Bart affectionately called it, a Bartivator. Um, we have a compressor and we have some side scan sonar equipment. So we're pretty set up to pretty much go wherever. And I would say about the range at 20 knots, we got about 200 miles. So we could go 100 and come back 100 and not run out of fuel. So we dream of finding undiscovered shipwrecks. So um, the ocean is basically a desert except for wrecks and obstructions. So the obstructions attract marine life. They also attract recreational fishermen like my friend Captain Bob that's on this uh, call, and they also attract wreck divers. But at the same time, commercial fishermen try to avoid shipwrecks because they don't want to get their gear caught up in the shipwrecks. The scallop fishing industry, um, scalpers want to avoid shipwrecks because it's a $500 million industry, but if they get their scallop dredge caught up in a shipwreck, it pretty much ruins their trip. So, so we have scalpers want to avoid the wrecks, but divers and fishermen want to find the wrecks. Now, as you can see in this photograph of the Ethel C, that here's a couple scallop fishermen that had some really bad days and had to tell their boss that they had to cut a trip short. Okay, if they if they lost their scallop dredge on the first day of the trip, I mean they could have lost a hundred thousand dollars. So you can see why. The, the fishermen want to know where the wrecks are. The scallop fishermen want to know where the wrecks are so that they can drive around the wrecks. Now, with all that said, the scallop fishermen um, um, have what they call hang logs. And the hang logs are basically a bunch of spots where they don't want to go because either they got hung up on their shipwreck or an obstruction or their friend got hung up or something happened at a spot where they don't want to go back to. So my friend Brian Sullivan um, and I collected about 29,000 unique obstructions between um, the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay and um, Atlantic City, maybe a little north of Atlantic City. So um, the reason that we collected these obstructions is what we did was in our database, in our software, we're able to see clusters. And we'll talk about that again in a minute, but basically, if you have enough data in the same spot, there's probably a reason that you have that much data there, and uh, therefore there could possibly be a shipwreck there. Now, what we did in our system was we overlaid our hangs, and then we had another layer where we have our um, known shipwrecks. Every single time we had a known shipwreck, we have a cluster surrounding that shipwreck. So basically the theory is to go find the clusters that we don't know where a known shipwreck is. Now, not only does it work in that case, but if your friend, if your friend, Captain Bob, gives you a list of numbers, you can, you can go to your database and go, oh, that's a good number, that's a bad number, oh, wow, I never heard of that number, um, and what have you. And it, it gives you a sort of an advantage when you're going out to look for shipwreck. So we had an area that we wanted to go look at, but simultaneously, Captain Bob gave me a list of some fishing spots. So we compared them to our database, and we, figured, we found some spots that we thought were good. So what we did was we picked one of these, we picked one of these spots um, for, for a number of reasons we picked the spots. But um, we picked this particular spot, and as it turned out, there was a huge cluster in this spot in 31 Fathoms. So we decided to go on a little adventure um, to go see what was happening in this area where um, it was reported that there were some things going on. So what we did was uh, Brian, myself, Michael Dudas, and Tom Packer, we got on the boat 
And you can see we headed really far south. I mean, we're literally off the coast of Virginia here. Like we're, we're due east of Pocomoke City. That's pretty far south. Um, we headed down there and um, we got to the wreck site. And we jumped in the water. Now, I got to tell you that Brian Sullivan and I, we were the first in the water this day. And we were pretty much for sure thinking we were going to go find another scout boat because uh, the last few times that we went out and did this, uh, three times in a row, we found some old fishing scallop boats. But to our surprise, we came down the anchor line, and this is what we saw. Okay, we saw a boiler, and it's funny because if you notice the top of this boiler is kind of lighter in color. It's actually white for real because there's coral on it. And Brian, Brian and I talked about it after the dive, and we thought we were looking at the roof of a scout boat. And we were like, oh, crap, it's the roof of a scout boat. But as we came down, it was clearly a steamship. Now, for the non-divers that are listening in on this call, it's sort of unheard of in this day and age to dive in a steamship that's like only in 188 feet of water. Okay, there are guys finding new steamships, but they're traveling like out and going and diving in 300 feet of water where, where no man has gone before, if you will. Uh, so to find a steamship in only 188 feet of water is like sort of super special. Okay. So what did we see when we came down? We saw the port boiler, we saw a steam condenser, um, a starboard boiler, and a little engine, and a whole bunch of debris. So let me take you on the dive. We can look around and see what we see. So this is a little engine, just sort of sitting up. Michael Dudas um, helped me out being super artistic, shining the light, um, shining the light through the through this little engine. Kind of, kind of a cool shot. Uh, this gives you a little bit more layout. Now, remember going back to our whole conversation about scalp fishing lost gear, you can see right here is a bag. This bag here looks like a net. This would have held scallops. So some guy, once upon a time, lost his net here, made the marks on, the, um, on his chart, and tried to avoid this place. But again, you can see the engine, the boiler, condenser, and another boiler. Another little, another perspective, kind of looking from the stern forward. And people ask about shipwrecks. Oh, you know, they think it's like um, in a cartoon, like the, the actual ship there. But really, um, you know, being underwater for 76 years is pretty much just a big pile of um, debris, uh, except for things that are really big and heavy, like boilers and engines and things made of brass. So you can see Michael do this here in the shot. He's sort of like looking around, um, really working the area around the engine. You always want to work the area around the engine because normally the wheelhouse is above the engine and the things that divers like to look for typically are in that general vicinity. Now, Michael um, is taking his scooter and he's using it as an excavation device. And you can see the big um, plume of... Um, debris, and he's trying to dig a little to see what he can find in this general vicinity. Now, remember, we talked about scallops, um, and this, you can see the scallops are down here. So it all ties together with the scallops, the scallop fishermen, not trying to find, not hit, trying to hit the wrecks, but the fishermen and the divers wanted to um, find the wrecks, and you can see the evidence of everything. Okay, so here's some more machinery. Michael's sort of lighting up the area. It looks like a radiator. Um, it's, you could spend hours down here. Unfortunately, it's in 188 feet of water, so spending hours is really not an option. So maybe a 30 minute, 35, 40 minute dive, maybe is all you got for the penalty of decompression. Uh, here's one of the boilers. It's very unique. It's riveted together. You can see the chain dogfish. Um, they're either called cat sharks or chain dogfish, go figure. Uh, they're little baby sharks. Uh, you never normally see these guys unless you're over maybe 160 feet. Uh, but again, I thought this was really neat, the, the way this boiler was riveted together. Another angle of the engine and the starboard boiler. And um, these things that look like flowers are sea anemones. Uh, they're like they're kind of like undersea flowers in, in a sense. But you can see how, how if you look out in the background, there's like nothing out there. But when you look at the obstruction, it's all got all kinds of things growing on there. It's got the anemones, all the marine growth, which makes an entire ecosystem, et cetera. Okay, so this was our dive. We come up. Now, 
You can say diving in New Jersey is kind of dirty, but as you can see here, it's not really because uh, when you get offshore, it's super clear. So uh, I think this is Brian and there's someone else here and we're doing our stage decompression. So the stage decompression is letting the air bubbles come out of your system slowly um, because otherwise you're going to end up like a bottle of Coca-Cola with a lot of bubbles coming out, which is not a good business model for a scuba diver. So you stage your decompression. Brian's down here at exactly 40 feet. So you can see it's very super clear um, here. And you never know in decompression because you have to stay there. You can't leave. If a shark's swimming around you, you can't leave. Well, on this particular day, Brian got a visit from some fish. And they were just hanging out with him. They thought he was cool. He thought they were cool. And um, they were just all kind of hanging together for a while. Okay. So um, on my dive, I found something really super special. I knew exactly what it was when I saw it. Um, I told Brian, I gave him like the shh, don't say anything when we get up on the boat. And I knew that Tom Packer and Mike Dudas would be super excited when we got up. So we come up on the boat and they're like, how was your dive? Blah, blah. And I'm like, I don't know. I found this old platter on the bottom. So I come up and it really wasn't a platter. It was what they affectionately known as the builder's plaque. So it's sort of like the cereal plate on your car. It's supposed to tell everything about your car. Um, this is supposed to tell you everything about the ship. So this is what it looked like as it came up from the sea. And it has some information here. It says Nylon's Verkstead, which is Nylon's workshop. It says mask number 537, uh, an abbreviated word for boiler number. And then it had a year, 1938, and it says Oslo. That's pretty cool. And Mike Dudas said, don't worry, as soon as we get back to shore, We'll just Google up some of these numbers. By, by tonight, we'll have this mystery solved. So the plaque was really sitting in the plane, completely open, facing up at about a 45-degree angle, um, right here between the boiler and the engine, pretty much where, where you would expect to find something like this. It wasn't hiding. It didn't have to get dug out. It was literally just sitting there facing up. So you can see a little better version of it uh, cleaned up. So um, just get a, a more a better perspective of what this thing looked like. Um, it was it was sand cast. You can actually see the tooling marks. It's really super interesting. So what else did we find on our dive? Well, we found some interesting things. We found this little uh, disc. It says push to dock in Norwegian. Uh, we found a bunch of terracotta tile, um, not that it was cargo, it was probably in the kitchen or somewhere. It says it has a name of a company made in Germany, nice clue. Had a fire brick uh, with the name of a city in Norway, and it had a lot of this. This is sulfur, like, and they're like rocks. So that's what we found. On our next trip, uh, Tim Terry found the helm and a porthole. I'm just holding it for a picture. I didn't find any portholes. Um, and this is from our second trip. So what do we do next? So we come home and Mike Dudas, of course, Googled it as soon as we got close to land, couldn't find anything. And we're like, all right, we got to solve this. We have to solve this mystery of what the shipwreck is. So this young lady here, I knew her when um, I was in high school. And she worked at the dive shop, Dudas's dive shop in Westchester, Pennsylvania, as a nanny for Evelyn Dudas. And because of the wonderful world, world of Facebook, um, we're Facebook friends, but I never really like chit chatted with her or anything like this. And then this is Gary Gentile, who um, we affectionately call the Dalai Lama shipwrecks. So the reason I put Hildrun here is because of Facebook, I knew Hildrun lived in Oslo. So what I did was, I sent her a Facebook Messenger message and said, hey, Hildrun, it's Rusty. Remember me? Um, I sent her a picture of this plaque. I said, could you do me a super solid and call over to the Maritime Museum and see if they know anything about this plaque? And, she, and because she had worked at the dive shop, because she had gotten certified, because she had gone diving with us on the Sea Lion, and she lived in Evie's house full of all the sea, sea shipwreck stuff, she, she kind of got it. I think if it was anybody else, they would have thought I was nuts. Um, so she was like, no problem. In the meantime, I called my good friend Gary Gentile, 
and I sent him the picture. So now we got two people, two parts of the world working on this project. In the meantime, we started doing a little digging. So um, the internet's a wonderful thing. You look up the shipyard, fine. You find a list of every ship they ever built from like the 1800s on, fine. You find a year, 1938, fine. And you find the six ships that they built in 1938. So once you get the name of the ship that they built in 1938, you can Google, you can Google the ship names and just see what happens to the ships. So uh, the first ship here was sent to Africa in 1966 and renamed Al Altier. I would say by the condition of our ship, it probably didn't sink after 1966. So we're going to eliminate that one. Now, it's kind of like that thing, if a tree falls in the woods, does it make any noise? Well, um, if, a, if a shipwreck is sunk with survivors, you know it actually happened. So the uh, Tabers fell, was sunk. Um, in 1942 by U-576 with three survivors. So clearly, if you had survivors from a shipwreck, you know what happened to that ship. The, Al the Alhama was sunk in 1941 by U-564 with 33 survivors. So you pretty much know what happened to those two ships. I'm going to skip the Octavian for a second. Um, the Nyko was sold in 1971, and the, and the Henrik Wigan was scrapped in 1968. So the only ship left is the Octavian, but unfortunately, if you Google the Octavian, it says that it was sunk, it was definitively sunk by the U-203 off of St. John, Newfoundland on January 17th, 1942, with no survivors. Okay, so, like I said, if you have no survivors, if you have no witnesses to the crime, you really don't know what happened. So this is kind of like, this really, I highlighted it for a reason, because this was kind of like, whoa, Something doesn't really add up here. Now, let me show you where St. John, Newfoundland is, okay? It's over here, okay? Now, um, so everyone keep in mind where they said that the Octavian sunk, okay? On the way to Newfoundland. Okay, so the internet, again, is an amazing thing. And can you believe it? Um, I think it's on War Sailors, we were able to find the actual manifest of the Octavian's voyages from 1941 and 1942. Now, the Octavian was a tramp steamer. A tramp steamer is a ship that basically goes uh, from port to different port to different port to different port. It's not a liner like New York to London or something like that. So you can see Galveston to St. John, New Brunswick, St. John to Botwood, Botwood to Pensacola, Etc. But you can see, interestingly, on 1 9 of uh, January, for, um, the 9th of January, it left Galveston and it was going to St. John, New Brunswick. Well, that's kind of crazy. How, why would it be in Newfoundland if it was going to New Brunswick? Because it, they'd have a really, not really know where they're going to, to miss New Brunswick. Okay, so St. John, New Brunswick. St. John, Newfoundland, and the reported sinking place of the Octavian. Well, clearly, clearly, if you're going to go over here, there's no reason for you to be over here. So as, as Mike Boring always tells me, stick with me, guys. Just stick with me, okay? Okay. So I send the picture to Hildrun. Hildrun, um, calls over to the museum, to Jorgen Johansson, who's like the head um, archivist over there. And um, Jorgen immediately gets back to me on the 6th of July. Now we dove the wreck on the 4th of July. It's two days later. He basically says, you can safely conclude that you have found the Octavian. Oh, now we're talking about changing history because everyone thinks a U-boat sank the Octavian up off of Newfoundland. So not only does he write us this nice email, but um, as a good um, archivist, he backs it up with information, which is the original contract of manufacture of the Octavian. And lo and behold, in the contract, it says motor number 537, 537, and boiler number 1023 and 1024, and 1023 and 1024. It's pretty much a slam dunk. So 
This is our Octavian sitting in our home port of Bergen, Norway. It's on the west coast of Norway. She was 258 feet long, 41 foot wide, and 1,345 tons. Now, remember, I want everyone to remember this 1,345. Not only did Jorgen have, and his team have the um, contract, but they had the original blueprints of the, um, of the manufacturer of the Octavian. Interesting configuration, which I, I don't know if I've never seen it before, but normally, as Gene Peterson always says, he says best. That's how you don't get lost on a shipwreck. Boiler, engine, stern, okay? Well, in this case, it's the boilers are next to the engine. It's very odd. Again, boiler, engine, boiler. It's a very odd configuration, unique to the ship. What are you going to do? Well, the meat of this here is really the 17 people that vanished. And the 17 sailors that their families never knew what happened to them. To Thelma, who's on this call, her great-grandfather, who just never came home, and her family for 76 years said it got sunk by a U-boat up off of Newfoundland. That's what the families knew. All these families, okay? All these, all these people, um, you know, um, uh, Thelma's, Thelma's um, great grandpa was only 35 years old. We had everyone from 23, 23 years old um, on up. Okay, and this is what's really important. 17 brave sailors who were never seen again serving the Allied war effort. So that brings us to the next part of our presentation about who sank the Octavian. So let's find out, let's go on a little, um, on a little uh, history lesson, because I learned all this about Norway I never knew. So Germany occupied, occupation of Norway begins in April of 1940, okay? Now, Germany wanted to occupy Norway for three basic reasons. They wanted to serve as a, as a base to stop Allied shipping. They wanted heavy water. Heavy water was what they were going to use um, in their nuclear bomb effort, because you need heavy water to make a nuclear weapon, apparently. And they wanted to secure the iron ore shipments from Sweden. These were the three main reasons. Also, interestingly, um, Norway, they, in the south of Norway, in uh, Kristiansand, they had a, a U-boat, they built a U-boat base. And the u who or the U-869 or the U-boat that you read about in Shadow Divers actually left from Norway, Kristiansand, uh, when it came to America. Now, simultaneously of when Germany took over Norway, um, the Norwegian Shipping and Trade Mission was started, uh, known as Nordship. So at the same moment that, that Germany moved into Norway, um, Nordship left Norway because they had all these ships running all over the sea, and they operated a thousand ships from London and New York, even though their homeland was occupied by the Germans. And at the time, it was the largest shipping company in the world. And this is really important to know that Norwegian ships supplying materials to Britain, including fuel, this was cited as the first great defeat and a turning point in the war um, for Britain against the Germans. Okay, December 7th, 1941, we go to war with Japan. December 11th, we go to war with Germany. So let's remember this December 11th date. So we go to war with Germany on December 11th, and, and five days later, okay, Germany is going to go have war with us with U-boats in America. It was the beginning of what they called Operation Drumbeat. Now, Operation Drumbeat is, is named that because it was Germany's way of saying that they're going to hear the beating of the war drums. We're going to come over and kick America's butt right on their own coast, and that's why they called it Operation Drumbeat. Um, fortunately for us, Germany only had five Type 9 U-boats that were ready to go to America. And the reason they needed Type 9, because they were long-range U-boats, and they could go to America and back and not have to refuel. And of these U-boats, you've got the 123, the 130, the 66, the 109, the 125. Now, 
they were sent to the east coast of the United States, and they were all scheduled in different locations to be ready, to be ready on January 13th, 1942. And the only exceptions were that if they saw an Allied ship over 10,000 tons before the 13th, they were allowed to blow them up. Now, so this is on, um, so this is December 16th. Okay, now we're going to fast forward to January. Okay, um, January 9th, 1942, there's a little steamship in Galveston, Texas, getting loaded up with, with sulfur. Okay, you can see on the right, these are the sulfur mines. It's kind of like strip mining in Texas, but where they, they have a lot of sulfur. And sulfur was really important for the Allied war effort. Okay, why? Well, it's uh, one third of the ingredient gunpowder, approximately. Um, rubber vulcanization. So it's basically um, when you make rubber, uh, you have to temper the rubber, give it its strength. You have to vulcanize it. They use uh, sulfur for that. Sulfuric acid, fertilizer, and mustard gas. So of all those five things, it's clearly something you would need if you were at war um, to help your war effort. Okay, at the same moment that that little steamship is getting loaded with sulfur, a U-boat heads west and ordered to be on station and ready to fight on January 13th. So this is where Gary comes into the picture because Gary, um, you know, anyone that knows Gary or doesn't know Gary, the guy's read like 10,000 books and I'm not seriously not exaggerating. If you go in his basement, he has at least 10,000 books that he has read every one. He knows everything there is to know uh, about shipwrecks. Um, I've known Gary since I was a teenager. And like I said, if someone's going to know what's going on, you call Gary. So I called Gary. I'm like, Gary, we found a steamship, blah, 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 the Octavian. Okay, so now he knows that. So Gary starts digging around in his, in his archives to see how he can help. Team player. So Gary pulls out a book that was written in 1996 called Hitler's U-Boat War. And he finds, like, a, I don't even know how he did this. He finds a, a footnote that says that um, somebody thinks that maybe um, um, the U-123 could have possibly sunk the Octavian. Okay, which no one ever was looking for the Octavian. No one ever really cared or heard about it, except obviously the families who lost their relatives. So there's this obscure um, footnote that, of course, Gary digs up. So then Gary writes an email to, to the team and says, oh, I forgot to mention I have a copy of the logbook of the U-123. Because who else would have a copy of a German logbook but Gary Gentile? Unfortunately, it was, it was written in German. But that's okay. That's where Mike Dudas shines because he's such a good Googler. Um, of course, Mike Dudas immediately finds... Um, uh, English translation. We'll get to that in a second. Now, um, on, on another thing, uh, pointing out, uh, he found an, uh, Gary found another um, footnote where he thinks there might have been a historical mix-up because the the Octavian was bound for Saint John, New Brunswick, but they said it was sunk off of Saint John, Newfoundland. Okay, and that possibly Hardigan kind of sunk the Octavian. So again. This is, um, this is another um, footnote that Gary found. Um, because in the history books, it says that the U-123, when it left New York on its way to uh, North Carolina, uh, that it sank a ship called the San Jose. And we'll talk about that in a minute. OK, so like I said, Mike Dudas, mad Googler, he finds us an English translation of the KTB, which is a working war diary of the U-123 in English on the internet. Fine. So now we think it's, now let me explain something, that if you were a U-boat commander, you wrote every single thing down in your uh, working war diary, because when you got home, you had to turn this into the boss, okay? Also, you had to document how many tons and everything that you sank. So this is the working, literally the copy in English of the working war diary from November of 41 to February 1942, written in the hand of Ryan, Captain Reinhard Hardigan. 
So I'm, I normally don't read from PowerPoint, but I'm gonna read this to you because it's super interesting. This is on January 17th, 1942. It says star, and this is at 1200 German time, which would be 6 a.m. our time, which is also January, which means it's dark out. Starboard light ahead, go for it. After a short time, I can recognize a freighter of approximately 4,000 gross tons, four hatches, heavily loaded. He only shows a lamp on the first mask and darkened position lights. Course, 13 degrees. Speed, 11 knots. Fortunately, unfortunately, dawn is breaking. While overtaking, I get a bit too close. On the spur of the moment, I cross his bow at a distance of 600 meters. I prepare my last stern torpedo and get myself into the dark horizon. Now, an hour and one minute later. Fired stern torpedo, target angle 90 degrees, distance 750 meters, running time 57 seconds, a very heavy detonation, strong, dark black smoke plume, hits the bridge, the steamer sinks immediately. As the smoke from the detonation cleared, only the masts were still visible in the water and shortly thereafter sank. Water depth 45 meters. I depart at maximum speed eastward because the day is dawning and I need to get some more water under our keel during the day. Due to calm seas and a cloudless sky, I decide to stay on the surface to reach Cape Hatteras fast, where according to radio messaging, shipping crosses. These are the exact words translated to English of a U-boat commander from January 17, 1942. Now, can't be the Octavian, right? Because it says 4,000 gross tons. But, you know, maybe someone could be exaggerating a little bit. But we have another clue. We have the clue that's called this. CA 5756 Northwest. The Germans were very crafty. In six digits, two letters and four numbers, they could locate themselves within six nautical miles of any place in the sea. It's kind of, kind of a neat idea. Um, also, when you're making radio transmissions, it's a lot better than transmitting your lab to longitude because anyone can pick up on that. So you can see in this chart that CA5756, so basically a big, a big block, CA, is about 2,916 square nautical miles, and a littler block, the 57, is 324 square miles, and the littlest block, the 56, is 36. Again, six by six. So, here's Cape, Cape May, New Jersey's here. Here's CA block. Here's the 57 block, and here's the 6. is right there. Well, it just happens to be very super-duper close to where the Octavian is. And let me tell you how close it is. It's 843 yards. So you got a U-boat commander in the middle of the night in 1942, locating himself within 843 yards of where he sank his ship. It's a pretty good job for navigation. So basically what happened is the U-123 came this way, continued to North Carolina, went to Bermuda and went home. And meanwhile, the Octavian came up from Galveston and they intersected at this location. So let's talk a little bit about the um, the U-boat. So this U-boat um, was a Type 9 U-boat. Um, it had a range of about 8,700 miles. It was 251 feet long and had a draft of 15 feet. If you take Reinhardt's Hardigan's depth under his keel the day that he sank the ship in his in his um, in his working war diary, and add 15 feet to that, it comes out to virtually exactly 188 feet, which is where the Octavian sits. Not to mention he was in the exact location where the ship is. Not to mention it was the same day the ship went missing. It's pretty much a slam dunk that Reinhard Hardigan sank our ship. Oh, and he said it had four holes, and um, the Octavian had four holes. So it's pretty much a slam dunk. Um, if anyone's been to Chicago, uh, there's a really nice U-boat museum. It's got the uh, U-505 in it. It's literally a Type 9 U-boat. So 
Um, Tim Terry got us an invitation to go there early. We could kind of sneak behind the barriers. And this is the stern torpedo hatch. This red lever is the lever that you would push to literally launch a torpedo. And this is literally looking at the stern torpedo. So this is literally what we're talking about that, that sank the Octavian. So um, the Octavian uh, had a very, uh, excuse me, the, um, the U-123, from a German perspective, had a very successful trip, considering it sank 58,000 tons of Allied shipping. Um, he came across the sea, and he sank the Cyclops. Now, remember what I said earlier, he wasn't supposed to shoot anything until January 13th, or be ready by the 13th. Well, on the 12th, he sank a British um, vessel, was only 9,000 tons, but you know, he probably exaggerated too at the time, but he didn't care. So he sank the Cyclops. He then sank the Nornis, which is up off the end of the Long Island, which the fellows on um, on the Tenacious Dive Boat, they, they, I think they dove that a couple of years ago. Um, and then he came up off of New York City, sank the Coimbra, it's a pretty classic wreck up off of um, New York, and then the Octavian. Um, and all the history books gave him credit for sinking the San Jose. The San Jose was the sister ship to the San Gil, a United Fruit Freighter. Unfortunately, the San Jose was in a collision on January 17th. It sank in because of a collision, and no U-boat commander in his right mind would waste a torpedo on a ship that was in a collision and already sinking. So uh, that was sort of like uh, never happened. And then it continued to sink... Um, uh, sink and or damage the rest of these ships before heading back to Germany. Operation Drumbeat was a huge success for the Germans. 609 ships were lost in this operation. 3.1 million tons of Allied shipping were destroyed. And the operation ended in August of 42. Okay, it's a lot of damage in a really short amount of time. But the um, carnage ended because the U.S., um, defenses and convoy use really strengthened, and, and we really uh, had the U-boats on the run after that. But again, the story's not about scuba diving, and it's not about U-boats. It's really about the people, okay? And anyone that's a shipwreck diver has been on shipwrecks, and I got to tell you, I'm just going to speak for myself, you really don't think about the people that were on the shipwrecks. You're going to go down and swim around and pick up a lobster or, or artifact or something like that. But this project is a watershed moment to really understand and learn about the people that, um, that were lost. So um, uh, these, are the, these are the people that were lost. They all had families. They had wives and children and mothers and fathers and you name it. And they just never came home. And this is what's really important. So um, what we decided to do um, was we really wanted to make our passion count, okay? So what we did was we reached back to Jorgen at the Maritime Museum and we said, hey, um, how about we give you your plaque back? Because <clears throat> at the end of the day, they were really super excited um, that we you know, had found the resting place of their, of their people. And um, we were super excited to go to Norway. So at the same time, uh, we put this all together. So what happened next, <clears throat> so what happened next was we went to Norway. Uh, we went to Norway on May 8th, and the reason that it was May 8th, because that's Liberation Day. But the museum had reached out, and they had found 87 descendants of the Octavian's lost crew. And it was a super special day, and we all went there. And this young lady, Dalma, right here, I'm going to come down and try to unmute, unmute Dalma. Where are you, girl? So she can say a few words. Dalma, pop back in. Hello. Hello, Thelma. Hello. How are you? Hey. <laughs> oh, there you are. I'm okay, fine, thank good. you. Okay. So, um, can everyone? Everyone can hear Thelma. And Thelma, why don't you say a few words about the project that you were doing for your school uh, at the moment that we found the ship? Yes. So um, I was in the last year of my high school uh, high school years, and uh, my history teacher gave me the assignment to write about the person in my family. Uh, and my entire childhood, this picture that you can see up here, 
uh, was hanging in um, the hallway of my house. I never really knew who he was or what he was doing, you know, why we had a picture of him. But when I asked my father uh, a long time ago, he said that it was his grandpa and that he died at sea. And that was really all I ever knew uh, until I started digging uh, when I got the assignment. And that's when I realized that the ship had been found only three months earlier. Uh, so I started to write the assignment and uh, dig into the past. Uh, and that's when I realized how much uh, my great grandfather's death had uh, affected my entire family. Uh, how his son became a father and how my father is a father for me. Um, and how much it has affected our lives and also his wife that uh, didn't have a job. So he lived on her, uh, his pension all these years after his death. So yeah, uh, when I wrote the assignment, I started to develop a strong relationship or a strong connection with my great grandfather uh, that I really didn't really know how to explain or uh, how I was feeling about it until the guys of um, the RV, the RV Explorer came to Norway. Uh, and when they started talking about how they found the wreck and uh, all the people that died, uh, I really started getting emotional and I realized how much it actually meant to me. So, um, yeah, when uh, Tim came to me and said that he wanted to give me the steering wheel of the ship uh, to, yeah, for me to remember my great grandfather. It really meant a lot, and uh, the work that you guys have done uh, really means a lot to me and my family. Thank you, Thelma. Thank you for um, for speaking up, and thanks for staying up till 12, 12 o'clock in the morning, okay? <laughs> thank you, honey. Yes, thank you. Okay. Okay, so um, we had this one wonderful, we had this wonderful day of presentation, wonderful day of, just amazing, thankful people. I want to talk about the war sailors of Norway. Norway is a seafaring nation. They've been going to sea since the Vikings. Now, um, the war sailors, because remember, there was Nordic ship, it was the biggest shipping uh, company in the world. They lost a lot of war sailors because they got torpedoed by a lot of U-boats. When the war sailors came home, they were treated not very nice. It was kind of like our Vietnam vets. You know, they came and they fought for our country in Vietnam. They came home, they got spit on, they got disrespected. Well, the war sailors got disrespected. They didn't get their insurances. They didn't get their pensions and what have you. And there was a big movement. There's been a big movement in, in recent years to, uh, recognize, to recognize the war sailors uh, who, never got, who never got recognized. So when we came to Norway, uh, on Liberation Day, um, they actually had some widows of the war sailors actually laid re laid some wreaths at this at the statue. Um, also, um, Bjorn Tour, who's pictured here in this um, in this picture, he works at um, Archivet, which is a, a a peace association that's really trying to bring um, bring some recognition to the war sailors. So it's just all the timing was just perfect. You can see that we gave the plaque back to Norway, of course, where it belongs, because that's where it came from. And after 77 years, the Octavian's Builders plaque is now home in Oslo, Norway, where the journey began. It will be on permanent display in the World War II section of the Norwegian Maritime Museum for future generations to see. A lasting example of people working together for a greater good. And as promised, you can see that Tim Terry is restoring the helm to give the helm back to Thelma's family. Thelma's grand, great grandfather probably had his hands on this wheel at the moment that he died. Okay, so if you talk about if you talk about full circle, no pun intended, it's a really the reality of this of this situation. Um, you know, we're living in a time right now with this coronavirus where people really have to work together. I think everybody needs to reflect back on all the drama and all the 
negativity in their own lives and at work and in their maybe some cousin they don't talk to because of something stupid. And just everyone needs to just get it together and just put all that stuff aside. And we need to move forward from this point in time um, just as a, as a better people and everybody just working together. That's my little speech for today. Um, okay, um, so we'd like to super thank everybody um, when we were in Norway. Um, obviously, the family, the, the Octavian Sailors, the staff um, of the Maritime Museum, um, all our friends there, and um, just everyone that helped us in this project. And, you know, those that aren't friends with us yet on Facebook can be our friends on Facebook. Now, I think you can ask questions. There's a little comment area here, a chat area. Um, if you guys see that, or I will unmute you if people don't talk over each other and we can just maybe, if someone wants to ask any questions. So I'm gonna um, try to unmute everybody. Okay, everybody's unmuted. And I will do my best. Uh, Rushton left. Yes. Hey Rushton, can you hear us? Yes, can you identify yourself? Hey, it's Dave Sutton. I don't know if you can see oh, me. I, I, got something in, hey, buddy. I got something in my hand. I, can you see this or not? Well, hold on, hold on, partner. Let me um, let me uh, find you. And I, and I got some good news for you. Okay, buddy. It doesn't uh, make any difference. I can't see. But go ahead, partner. Well, you know, you, you're uh, you're just you're just a little off on Hardigan's navigation. He was only a hundred yards off. He said he sank it from 750 yards, and he was 850 yards off the mark. So he was only 100 yards off his navigation. That's a good point. That's a really good point. <laughs> That's all. Wonderful presentation, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Rusty, uh, Mike Boring, well done. Excellent. Boring, Mike. Wonderful job of preserving history. Thank you. Greatly appreciated. Hey, Rusty, it's Diane on Guam. Hey, Diane. Uh, among all of you guys, there's thousands of shipwrecks that you guys have dived. How often is it that you find a builder's plaque on dive number one of an unidentified ship? Uh, pretty much never happens, mostly. <laughs> <laughs> Well done, thank you. I think um, not to get too weird on you, but I, I think uh, I think we have some help. Oh, from up above. From up above. Just saying. Okay, well done. Thank you, Rusty. Thank you. <laughs> any other any other comments, questions? What's next? What's next? Well, that's a great question. We have, we have so many things to check out this year. Anybody that's on this call, it's in the Northeast, it's a tech diver, wants to come dive with us. We have a bunch of trips, search trips this year. So if you're ready to dive in 200 feet, send me a message or an email and um, we'll get you on a trip. Um, every time we dive a cluster, we find something. It might not be a steamship, but uh, Michael Dudas and I and Andrew, we have some good ideas on uh, some places to go look. Anything else? Well, I wish everybody, um, if there's no other questions, I wish everybody um, a really nice Easter holiday with their families and um, just have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you, Michael, for tuning in all the way from Japan. Nan, Thanks, all the way from Guam, Diane from Guam, uh, John, um, and everybody from California. I just really want to thank everybody and um, come diving in Cape May. Come dive the classics with Mike Boring and Becca. All right? <laughs> Thanks, Rusty. Thanks, Rusty. All right, guys. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Everyone have a great night. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Bye bye. Thank <laughs> you.